I really like those things which are simple by its core nature yet have a significant impact on our life and how we interact daily and how this building in Mumbai changed India like never before. If you visit to any store, grocery or anywhere in India, you will see these QR codes everywhere. Yes, I'm talking about UPI. But how does it work? Like what exactly happens when I send money to someone? And most importantly, why did we create a UPI in first place? For that, we need to go back to mid 20th century just to understand how different US and India was. Post independence, Indian economy was not in a great shape. Majority of India's population was and still belongs to agricultural and low wage income sector. As you can see, where the per capita GDP of US has significantly shot up since 1960, compared to that of India, it has barely increased from 82 to 1900 dollars. And in such environment, when people don't have large sum of money, protecting their wealth is extremely crucial for any country's economy. The thing is, if people can't trust the banks and financial institutions, they will not put their money into them, which banks can give out as a loan to corporation, which can create many jobs, thus giving a kickstart to economy. India has witnessed numerous banking scams in the past, which is something we have learned and improved from. Every bank is regulated and constantly monitored by this government body called RBI or Reserve Bank of India. For simplicity, you can consider RBI as a boss under which every bank operates. RBI is very customer centric, so basically their job is to see whether all banks are functioning properly or not. Also, we have one of the strict regulations unlike any countries to protect the wealth of end consumer which I previously mentioned. Apart from cash, we initially had checks and demand draft as a mode of payment, but they were more painful than directly using cash and none of them were idle to send money at long distances since checks and demand draft took almost a week to process the transaction. So the NEFT or National Electronic Fund Transfer was created in November 2005 under the umbrella of RBI trying to solve the exact same issue of transferring money faster. Here's how it works. NEFT acts as a centralized switch through which every bank gets to connect with. Now the end user of this bank can send money to anyone's bank account since this payment network was widely adopted. As an end user, all you need to know was where is your friend's bank branch which is represented by IFSC code and their bank account number. The main issue it has compared to modern payment method is it processes all the transaction in batches. Let's say you send money to your friend at 9.15 am. NEFT will record your request and store it along with thousands of other individuals who want to send money to someone during the time of 9 to 10 am. Then NEFT will collect all those batch requests and send money to your friend's bank account around 10 am. You might question that why NEFT behaves in such a way, why it can't send money in real time. There is no clear evidence available out there that could answer it for all of us. But from my speculation, I can say that since this system was developed in 2005, Having abandoned internet bandwidth and compute power was a real challenge. On technical side, implementing this system is way more easier since you don't need to validate the transaction and do the fraud detection like what we need to do with debit or credit cards. But the things have got better nowadays. Earlier we have 24 hourly batches but now it has increased to 48 batches. That is instead of 1 hour, now the transaction time is reduced to half an hour. Hmm, not bad. In 2007, the next successor of NEFT was RTGS or Real Time Gross Settlement which is a US standard that has been adopted by many countries. By the name, you have already got the idea that it processes all the transaction in near real time which is incrementally better than NEFT. The fundamental issue with both of them is in order to use it, you need to know how to use net banking and if you have ever used net banking, be it of SBI, HDFC and ICSA bank, you know how beautiful the user experience is. I mean the UI UX still sucks in 2022. The amount of hurdle that one need to cross is just unbearable. First enter the password, then enter the OTP, do some additional configuration, then add beneficiary and then only you can send money to someone. And especially in country like India where digital literacy is still a greater challenge. This solution will not be adopted by people in tier 2, 3 and rural areas. Moreover, NEFT and RTGS aren't idle to do daily microtransactions to buy stuff at Kirana store, groceries and all. Don't get me wrong, NEFT and RTGS are still widely used today if you want to send lakhs of rupees as UPI still has the limit of 1 lakh rupees per day. Probably you might get your salary via NEFT, Amazon returns money via NEFT. If you have any online business then you might get payout from NEFT from Razorpay, Stripe because it's cheaper and most convenient for such scenarios. 
You might now question that why don't banks come forward and provide their own solution. In simpler terms, making things is generally easier than marketing it. Banks already make ton of money by giving out of loans, which is easier for them rather getting into payments business. Especially in software world, having proper standards for security and procedure is really important. Let's say SBI has their own way of making payments which is different from what HDFC is doing. Then SBI's account holder won't be able to send money to HDFC's user since both of them aren't compatible. Also, network effect plays an important role. We all know that Signal is more transparent than WhatsApp. But we still use WhatsApp because our friends and families are there. So RBI acts as a centralized body that connects every bank with one another with proper standard just to ensure everything works smoothly. Also, RBI would never allow anyone to monopolize on flow of money. As recently, they have released a guideline which made every financial institution to be interoperable with one another. Moving on forward, after NEFT and RTGS, in 2008, RBI created an another non-profit organization called NPCI, which directly works under Ministry of Finance with an aim to digitize the Indian economy and create solutions for Indian scenario. Remember this building? This is one of the four offices of NPCI that is spread across India. NPCI has created numerous products like Rupee Card, AEPS, IMPS, UPI, which is a subset of IMPS. But for the scope of this video, we will be sticking to UPI. The way UPI works does give an amazing insight on how system should be designed for large scale. As we saw in NEFT where we need to enter account number and IFSC code in order to send payment to a friend, we can replace the account number and IFSC code with VPA or virtual payment address, which can be later mapped to account number and IFSC code. I'll talk about VPA in just a minute, but first we need to understand which parties are involved in this whole UPI thing. First is the NPCI itself, which acts as a centralized switch. Second, banks are linked to the NPCI. Third are the PSP or the payment service provider like Google Pay, Phone Pay, Paytm, Samsung Pay, etc. And last come the end user like you and me. Now this PSP have to acquire a unique suffix in the VPA from issuer bank. Like in the case of Google Pay, you might have seen such as at the rate OK Axis, at the rate OK HDFC, OK SBI and OK ICICI. What it essentially means that if you want to create an app like Google Pay which uses UPI, you have to work with any of the issuer bank which is linked with NPCI who can give you the suffix of the VPA except for Paytm Payments Bank and other bank because they can act both as a VPA suffix issuer and can have their own PSP app linked to their own bank. Google Pay works with SBI, HDFC, ICICI and Axis Bank and all of these suffix are exclusively owned by Google Pay. NPCI has to look forward to ensure that no two PSP get the same suffix. You might now question that why Google Pay needs so many suffix from different bank. Well, the answer is pretty simple. In March 2020, PhonePay was not working for many hours because PhonePay's infrastructure initially relied only on Yes Bank, which went down. So to prevent this scenario, PhonePay and Google Pay have tied up with multiple banks to avoid such scenarios. Now we are set to ride on a journey of using UPI. So how to get on board? First and foremost, you will need an Indian bank account and your mobile number, which should be linked to it. Second, you will need to have a debit card issued from a bank. Then you will need to download any of the app that supports UPI. Just to stay neutral, I would like to take example of BMAP for this demo. I would also like to showcase this ad made by NPCI. During the registration, you need to pick any language. Then you need to select your SIM. You will be asked to grant permission to do phone call and send SMS. The reason why it does is it reads the IMEI number and SIM card details. I'll talk about in detail once we discuss the security aspect of UPI. Then. If you are Android, it will automatically detect the OTP, verify yourself and after that you will need to select your bank. Now you will need to know the last 6 digit of your debit card and its expiry date. OTP will again be sent to your phone. Now at last you will need to require to set a UPI PIN which is needed whenever you do the transaction. All of the sensitive data like PIN, passwords, biometric etc are stored in encrypted format on your device. Finally, we are now ready to make payments. What actually happened in this process is your PSP, let's say Google Pay, initiated a user creation request to NPCI. Then NPCI forwarded this request to your bank, fetch all the necessary details like account number, IFSC code, etc. And then Google Pay assigns you a VPA or a virtual payment address, 
which you can change the prefix of it later. So now let's say I use Google Pay and want to send money to my friend Atharva who is using Phone Pay. There are three options for me in which I can do that. In earlier days, I had to know what his UPI address was in order to send money to him. But now as the time passed, most of the PSP also have added the feature that if you don't know any person's UPI address, you can search it via phone number. The third way is PSP also support payments if you directly have the account number and IFSC code of the person whom you are trying to send money to. So now let's send him 500 rupees. After I enter my UPI pin, the request is forwarded to NPCI, which acts as a central switch. Then it checks the suffix of VP of my friend. In our case, it's phone pay. So basically it requests all the account details and IFSC code from phone pay. The request is sent back again to NPCI. Then it forwards the payment request to my bank. Let's say ICICI bank telling to deposit 500 rupees to his bank account. So it sends back the response and finally the payment has been settled in his bank account. Again, we are not done yet. His bank needs to send a confirmation notice to NPCI that the transaction was completed. And in turn, he and I will get the confirmation on both of our UPI apps that the payment was done successful. Moreover, Banks also send the SMS notification to both of us just to confirm that the transaction was successful. In hindsight, UPI works with XML payloads, which is something you are seeing right now. At this moment, I don't claim that I understand everything of it since I haven't worked with XML. Compared to Visa and Mastercard, this system is way more simple. But nothing in this world is absolute perfect. And it's interesting to ask that how does NPCI manage the failure in UPI transaction? because servers too go down, be it from banks or PSP themselves. So in technical documentation of NPCI, they have listed all sort of failure scenarios in which a UPI transaction could be unsuccessful and what they should be doing in order to really tackle those failure problems. And going through all of them isn't just possible. So for our use case and demo, I would like to highlight these two interesting scenarios. Consider this, if NPCI sent the request to my bank to send money to Atharva, but it doesn't really send any response. So in that case, it will just simply time out the transaction. In second case, let's say it reaches to my friend's bank account, but his bank fails to notify NPCI about the transaction status. Then NPCI will pass on several requests to my friend's bank account to transfer money back to my bank account. Now, normally we people are not good with remembering things. I bet no one will remember anyone's UPI address as there might be thousands of people who might you want to send money to. So how to solve this problem? UPI was prominently designed for modern smartphones, although it also supports feature phone by IVR. But anyways, every smartphone feature have camera built in, which can be used to scan QR codes. We all know that QR code is a new thing. We can encode UPI address into QR code. Just go into store, scan the QR code and make payment. This level of ease is one of the reasons why UPI is so popular nowadays. UPI has undergone through two major evolutions that is version 1 and version 2. Version 1 only supported to send payment and request payment from your friends and families. Version 2 which has been currently used which was launched in 2018 added an important feature of auto payment where if you have a subscription of any service your money will be automatically debited to that service. Kinda like how credit card subscription works. But now how secure UPI is. For this, I have taken in help of this research paper from University of Michigan and this YouTube conversation. Majorly, UPI has undergone through two major versions that is version 1 and version 2. RBI mandates two-factor authentication for any online transaction in India. For net banking, you need to enter the password plus OTP. But in case of UPI, you just need to enter the UPI pin. So where is the second factor? Well, the second factor lies in the device tokenization. During sign up, it does ask for phone and SMS permission. The reason for that is UPI physically binds your phone IMEI number and SIM detail for your UPI account. What it essentially means that you can install multiple UPI apps on a single phone, but you can't run your UPI account on multiple devices. This is done to enhance security and minimize the risk of phishing attacks. Another benefit of doing this is since your UPI account is linked to IMEI and phone number which are universally unique, by tokenizing it, we can eliminate the need of using OTP which can make our experience non-intuitive.
in UPI 1.0 with regards to BMAP had one critical vulnerability that if someone tried to create an account with airplane mode while keeping Wi-Fi on, it will essentially fail to get the OTP. In such scenario, after failing multiple times, it will ask you to enter any mobile number. So now let's say in this attack, hacker enters his phone number. He will receive SMS on his device. Now he has control over my bank account directly. As I previously mentioned, digital literacy is main challenge in India, especially in rural areas. Even though after Android 5.0 Marshmallow, users need to manually grant permission to the apps in order to do what they want to do. Many users simply don't read all those permissions and grant all the access to whatever the app may demand without knowing how it could potentially harm the user. Compared to iOS, Android has been a relatively insecure platform. Google Play didn't had a good reputation in past on enforcing strict guidelines on app developers. Also, many apps had potentially been found to have malware attached to them. Many Indians also use pirated apps by downloading modified APK without knowing that there might be a Trojan or malware beneath it. And if it could monitor your activity inside any UPI apps, then that's a deadly thing. Paytm has a list of all the blacklisted apps to which if it finds your phone contain any of those apps, it will just simply not open itself. Think about it for a moment. You are essentially trying to build a financial system based on such insecure platform. What if your phone was rooted? Then that problem might get even worse. This isn't a theoretical stuff, but a genuine concern to worry about. But I really want to thank these folks who reported this vulnerability to NPCI. And luckily, NPCI has addressed all these issues in UPI 2.0 in 2018. And today, if you see any UPI apps, they won't simply allow you to enter your phone number. Rather, it will fetch from your device like what we have previously seen. One of the important things during my research was I really wanted to know what tech stack are they using? What are the compliances issues? What kind of SDK are they using in the production? But from what I got to know is that UPI is a proprietary protocol and all of these compliances issues and all of the how it works is a close guarded secret. What it essentially means that take for example World Wide Web. It runs on top of open source protocols, be it HTTP, BitTorrent, SSH, and FTP and other protocol itself. You can literally go to GitHub and check the source code and see just how it's been working in behind the scene. Be it in C, C++, Java, Node.js, Golang, Python, or any other language. That is not the case with NPCI and UPI itself. Since everything flows through NPCI and NPCI acts as a central switch, that raises a security question that how much trust should we put into NPCI. However, there is one aspect of UPI that is indeed open that is called deep linking. Deep linking is what allows QR code to be made and it works flawlessly in our UPI app itself. Again, if you are a developer, I would highly recommend you to check this GitHub page in order to know more about deep linking itself. As a demo, here's how it works. Suppose you want to send money to this address and you want to make a QR code out of it. What you will need is an UPI protocol, just like what we use HTTPS and enter the domain name. Similarly, we need to specify to whom do we want to pay. Here, the PS stands for payment address. And if you convert all this text string into QR code and open any of your UPI app and scan this QR code, now you can send money to me. UPI was launched in 11th April 2016, but initially only 21 banks joined it and there was not any response from an average end consumer until this man made one of the most controversial decision in history of Indian politics. You wanted people to use less cash, mm -hmm. you could have asked them nicely. You didn't mm -hmm. have to shock the system and kill civilians. He said that he was waging a war on black money and the move is in the larger good of the nation. But has Modi's biggest gamble really paid? Overnight, Indian economy came to a halt. Millions of Indians flocked to bank to get their old note exchanged. India was in the dying need of an alternate payment method other than cash. Paytm saw this opportunity and heavily invested into expanding its distribution and quickly promoted its payment wallet. Millions of sign-up requests flocked to Paytm. Paytm didn't initially support UPI. It was until PhonePay and Google Pay that entered into market aggressively with UPI forced Paytm to adopt UPI. In 2016, Narendra Modi announced the launch of BMAP, which accelerated the growth of UPI. 
and what happened after that was nothing short of a miracle. UPI went on to just having 21 banks to 313 banks and hit record in April 2022 of transacting 9.83 lakh crore rupees. Now to be fair, it was an intensive effort of Paytm, PhonePay, Google Pay that set up the QR code to all the stores in India. But there was one little problem to it. All of this player used to charge 1 or 2% of the commission from merchant every time and users send money to them. Like in markets like India, where the margins are razor thin, even this 1-2% to commission is detrimental for their income. And forget about using a POS machine, where the MDR is even higher. Now in 2018, a black sheep entered in the market and took away all the market share from this giant. That black sheep is none other than Bharat Pay. Their strategy was really simple. They had no transaction cost to merchant which allowed their user base to grow like wildfire. And government of India took notice of it and got a key insight that merchants are willing to accept online payment if there is no transaction cost to both merchant and end consumer. They don't care about black or white money. All they want is if anyone shops 1000 rupees from them, then they should get 1000 rupees in their bank account, rather taking 2% cut and getting 980 rupees deposited in their bank account. So what they did was no short of bold step. On Jan 2020, Nirmala Sitaraman, the current finance minister of India, announced that there will be 0% MDR on rupee and UPI transaction. Wait a minute, you might have listened to this quote that there is no free lunch in this world. I mean, if the transaction cost would be zero, then how would everyone in this UPI ecosystem survive? I mean, they also need to pay their own server cost, pay their own salary to the engineers and all of the cost itself. For that, government of India has allotted a budget of 1300 crore rupees to compensate everyone in this UPI ecosystem. You might again question that isn't it a wastage of taxpayers' money? Well, not really. If you look at the UPI transaction that occurred during Jan 2021 and December 2021, that total year itself, around 2021 itself, that was close to around 57.98 lakh rupees. I mean, that is just huge amount. And that is only itself about UPI itself. We aren't talking about rupee transaction, AEPS or any other payment method that uh, NPCI supports. So let's assume that government of India wants to spend 1300 crore rupees just to allow 57.98 lakh rupees to be spent in economy and let's do the expense ratio of it. For simplicity, let's round off this number to 58 lakh crore rupees and let's do the calculation. If you do the expense ratio correctly, that would turn out to be like 0.0002% and that is like dirt cheap. Like I mean, it's it's there is no such uh, cheap expense ratio anywhere on the earth and that itself is the power of UPI itself. And if you really add the rupee transaction, it will virtually become zero. It's like me giving my grandmother one paisa and convincing her to send one lakh rupees to her relative via net banking, which she have never done before. Think about how many startups will be built around this UPI ecosystem. Take for example any startup which offers bookkeeping solution, taxation solution to small scale merchants. Now Razorpay and Paytm does support UPI on their payment gateway. Income tax can do their job much more easily. UPI model has been so successful that Google has recommended to US Federal to adopt payment method like UPI. India has exported this payment network to Nepal, Bhutan, Malaysia, Singapore and UAE. UPI isn't something we have copied from the West. Instead, we built it from the scratch to meet our own needs. And personally, it made my life much easier. And I don't really mind government spending taxpayers' money to keep all of this free since it's very nominal cost and save ton of money in printing and distributing paper notes. The model of UPI does prove that payment should exist as a utility rather than a for-profit commercial entity. And this can only happen when it has a backing of government. With the realm of Indian politics, anything that government dip their toes into either turns into a complete garbage or turns into a gold. And I'm glad, at least in the case of UPI, it has turned out to be the gold mine for Indian economy. Well, this was my presentation of why UPI matters. I hope you have really liked this video. If you want to support this channel financially, you can send me money by UPI to this QR code. Even if it's 1, 10, 100, 500 rupees, that would mean a lot to me. It would definitely be helpful for me to increase the production quality of this channel itself. Again, I really want to thank you in advance if you choose to donate your money to this channel itself. There is no compulsion, 
if you are under 18 please don't send your money to me itself again uh, that was what i want to say if you have liked this video consider subscribing to the channel stay connected and i see you next time